When I'm on my own, which is most of the time because I'm traveling, traveling now. Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with award-winning vocalist and actress Luba Mason. We had a spirited conversation about her new 2020 CD called Triangles. Her husband is a 17-time Grammy Award-winning musician, Ruben Blades, and she was a guest vocalist on his 2002 Grammy Award-winning CD, Mundo. And over the years, she has toured the U.S. and abroad. She is a native of New York, born in Astoria, Queens, and a first-generation American of Slovak descent, who started on the keys at the age of five. Over the years, she has acted seamlessly from the stages of New York to the scenes on the screen in Hollywood. She was born to be an artist. Enjoy her story. First and foremost up front, you know, the elephant in the room in this world that we live in is COVID, and you have a, a brand new album, Triangles. Does it feel refreshing to be able to put out new material for listeners right now at this particular time? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I was debating whether I should even release the album or not because of COVID. After going back and forth, why not? Uh, first of all, I had the time and I could really focus on it. And I thought, you know, everybody's at home now and, and isolating and what a better time to release some new material and hopefully more listeners would get a chance to listen to it. I mean, the fact that COVID happened actually did weigh in on uh, my, my release time. What are you ultimately hoping the listener gets from this experience, whether they download or buy it? What do you want them to get from this project? The minimalistic value of the instrumentation with the voice and, you know, just the whole presentation of the album. It, I call it Triangle because there's only three of us. Uh, it's just voice, vibraphone, and bass. And I made sure I had a couple of thoroughbreds <laughs> right behind me. I have Joe Locke on vibes, and I have James Genus on bass. And there's such a purity, I think, and a clear cleanliness to to the whole uh mood of the album because it's just the three of us and it's i find or i've been told it's refreshing with all the uh, production value that's that's out there right now on 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 albums um you know there's just so much production going on and uh this is just the three of us and we recorded it live at the power station in new york city in front of a small uh group of people it was about 50 people we had in the studio so um it's a real intimate experience joe has been a friend of the show he always has wonderful stories and the last time i saw him he was in kansas city it was december 8th it was actually my son's birthday a few years ago and something happened and his vibes didn't come in. So a local vibes guy, Peter Schlam, had to bring his set in. And he actually had a broken leg. It was, it, it was very interesting, the whole thing. But Joe is uh, what a tremendous player. We, we're very biased around here with the vibes. I love that instrument as, uh, on any album. So what kind of joy was it to have somebody as steeped in history of jazz as Joe on the album? Well, he, yeah, he's a real virtuoso uh, on the vibes. Uh, I don't think anybody plays any faster than him and thinks so quickly on his feet. And I agree with you. I am also a huge fan of the vibes. Um, before this Triangle album, I had a band, my last one, uh, called Mixtura. And uh, I ha vibes were, were my main. Instead of a piano, I chose the vibes to be in the band. It just gives the music a whole different sound and so much more identifiable yeah I, I i think it's really a beautiful instrument and to have joe playing with me and it was the first time really uh, that i've ever really played with him he was not in my previous band so working with him has been definitely up to my game and and just a, a real sweetheart i mean he's and he's just full of as you say history um and experience so um that's an asset in any group and any album well and you have a lot of history too not only with singing but with acting and i'm sure this time of of quarantine has been a lot of self-reflection 
What did you learn about yourself that maybe you didn't realize before that's going to make you stronger as you promote this album and reemerge out to the world? What has made me stronger? Well, first of all, I had COVID early on, right when, when the world shut down. I had it in March of 2020. I definitely felt stronger <laughs> physically when I released the album. Uh, wow. I felt I had, some, I had some antibodies in me. During the COVID time, there was, it was a real time of reflection. There was the whole George Floyd thing going on as well. And it's like, what can I put and contribute into this world <laughs> to make it a better place? at this, you know, really challenging, challenging time. And music is just so soothing. It's healing. And it's a beautiful thing. It, it will change one's mood and feelings on things. Yeah, it, it was really the reflection of the, of the time that I felt this is, this is really important to do at this time. So how did a girl from Astoria, New York, grow up to become a singer and actress like you've become? What, what happened to give you this, this bug that would not only create, but to love jazz? I think there was a real curiosity. I grew up, my parents are immigrants. They're from Eastern Europe. And I grew up in a very ethnic household. They're from Slovakia. And Slovak was my first language. English is my second language. So Slovak ethnic music was the first kind of music that I ever heard and listened to. And as immigrants, they wanted to give their children, my sister and I, things that they didn't grow up with, which were um, music lessons, singing lessons, piano lessons. And I was a classical pianist for 13 years. So there was that background. And then I um, listened to the pop radio. Um, I loved that pop music. And even uh, going to the library, it's going to date me, but I started to take out albums of, of musicals. And then I grew this love of musical theater. And the albums that I was taking out, I got to jazz later on in life because it was a new area to explore, and that's where the curiosity comes in. I just had such a curiosity in all different kinds of music, which is what led me to my previous album, Mixtura. I, I uh, trademarked my own genre. Mixtura is a blend of different musical currents, and actually in all of my albums, almost all my albums, I have an eclectic set list. This album that I did with Joe and James is Triangle is uh, also has an eclectic set list, but it's all under the umbrella of jazz, the jazz arrangements. So yeah, it was, I think, really the, the curiosity. Just wanted to learn more. And, and I forgot to mention my husband is, is, is a Latin icon, and he brought Latin music into my vocabulary. You know, it was from there that I went into jazz, and I just thought, you know, I just, it's, it, it's really just about expanding your horizons and your knowledge and, and constantly learning, always challenging yourself. Well, and I was going to get into that. Very famous husband, Reuben Blades. Aside from everything else of, of being husband and wife, what has he taught you about the music world? What has he taught you about the jazz world that's really helped you get to where you want to be? As I said before, he exposed me to Latin music. And if anybody listens to Latin music, it is, has some of the most complex rhythms in it. Uh, he, he performed salsa, but he also turned me on to Brazilian music and, and all different forms. Him exposing me to Latin music widened my curiosity. I mean, Latin music to me is, is, has a lot of jazz in it. I mean, the rhythms and the, the, the complexities and, and the syncopations and, and the freedom. So he turned me on to that, which led to a lot of jazz, um, music that he also listens to. Yeah, that's what he really contributed. And he opened my world up. He just really opened my world up. He's been around a long time and he's, he's performed with a lot of different, um, you know, musicians. One of his latest was Chick Corea before he passed away. So, uh, you know, Chick did a, did a Latin album. And so there again is bridging the jazz with the Latin music. And so just his, and he, his, one of his dearest friends, Ruben's dearest friends was Lou Reed. And there's, there's like a whole nother spectrum of, of, uh, you know, the rock and roll that, that, that was, was integrated. And Elvis 
Elvis Costello is a dear friend, as well as Sting and and Paul Simon, who is a dear friend of mine, which is where I met Ruben. Uh, that's where my, all my different worlds collided. I made my base as a performer on Broadway, and Paul Simon did a show on Broadway uh, called The Cape Man. And Paul was one of my, I, you know, he was one of my um, icons that I grew up with, and I, you know, just really admired him. And it was in this Broadway production, which is where I lived at the time, where I met Ruben, and the show was, uh, had a Latin Latin musical theme to it, which Paul wrote, and so the the Broadway with Paul, with Ruben, with the Latin music, it all just came into my world all of a sudden and exposed me to so many areas that I'd never been exposed before. Speaking of all of these different areas of your life coming together, I mean, you have Broadway, which you've been very well established and recognized, Hollywood. And, and you have the singing. How do all of these ids, these creative arcs that you're into, come together to make you a whole artist? How do they work for you? Uh, they all complement each other. For instance, right now I'm in uh, the musical on Broadway, Girl from the North Country, which has music by Bob Dylan. And I had to learn how to play the drums this show and, and sing lead, sing <laughs> Sweetheart Like You while I'm playing the drums. Every element... Um, the acting, the singing, the the musicianship, the exposure to jazz, Latin, it all feeds into the same pool of artistry. I can take different elements from all of these areas and apply it to whatever project I'm doing. My My album, Triangle, has a Spanish bolero on it, and I sing in Spanish. I have a Paul Simon tune on this album, um, and again, they're all with like most of them have like jazz uh, arrangements to them. And I just recently performed. I opened for Ruben at Madison Square Garden and at the Wang Theater in Boston for his show for his tour. You know, when you're performing live, the acting element comes in. I'm not just a singer. It's really about relaying the message of the song to the audience. Everything um, feeds, feeds upon one another. So what was, the, you know, the, it's kind of like way back in the day when they would try to hook people on cigarettes. You get that first taste and you want more. You oh. get one, that two, you want more. So jazz is kind of like that. It's an, it's an addiction. What, oh, was yeah. the first, what was the first live jazz show you saw that made you think, wow, this is it? Honestly, it was when I was in high school. I was looking through the art section of the New York Times and also my local paper in, uh, I grew up in Rockland County, New York. This was after I'd lived in Astoria, Queens. Sarah Vaughan was playing at Carnegie Hall. She was singing at Carnegie Hall. And I saw so many ads about Sarah Vaughan everywhere. And I thought, I didn't really know who she was. And I I started to investigate, and I realized she was this jazz singer, and she's a big deal. And I asked my parents for, for a ticket, one ticket to go see her at Carnegie Hall, because I wanted to see and hear what all the fuss was all about. And, of course, it was in her later years, um, but that was my very first exposure to jazz. I heard Sarah Vaughan sing at Carnegie Hall and I was by myself and I had no one to really bounce these feelings off of but I just thought how beautiful and how different. I mean I was used to singing my pop music and my show tunes at home and I'm also a classically trained singer so I was exposed to a lot of classical music but this was different. She was very free on stage. She was um, you know, melodies were being bent. Um, it was a whole new form and experience that I had never heard before, and I loved it. I loved it, and I wanted more. So, uh, yeah, that was my first experience. Wonderful. So when you just think kind of holistically about this, why do you love jazz? The freedom, unlimitless possibilities of where the music can go 
and it, it it will never be the same more than more than twice you know i mean every time you perform a song you sing it differently or it's played differently or there's a different solo or the possibilities are just endless in jazz um it's just never the same way more than once you know the one thing too is you've been fortunate you've won awards over your career for a variety of things and i'm curious i don't want to know what your favorite one is but which one did you get that surprised you the most that just kind of threw you for a loop hmm well, I think the one that really surprised me, I, w I was in an off-Broadway musical called Pretty Filthy about the porn industry, of all things. I had bronchitis on opening night when all the reviewers came, and I didn't have much of a voice. And surprisingly, I was nominated for a Drama Desk and also a Lucille Lortel Award for for the role that I did in the show. I think that surprised me the most uh, because... I felt I wasn't at the top of my game because I was sick, but apparently, I guess, whatever I did on stage came across regardless. Wonderful. You have a dream tonight, and you run into your younger self about around the time that you were starting to become a professional and really get into, to get into your career, and you could give your younger self one piece of advice based on the wisdom you've gained over the years. And this isn't a regret question. It's about taking what you've learned and, and, and giving your younger self something, what would it be? What would you tell your younger self? Oof. Be patient. Be patient. Everything doesn't have to happen all at once. You have a lifetime to learn and absorb so many wonderful things in your professional life as a performer and to just keep learning. Keep learning. Be curious. Beautiful. So, you know, as we all kind of get back to things, you know, everything's kind of, it's like everything, once everything starts in this whole COVID world, it kind of slows down because there's a variant. But things did pick up, and hopefully things are getting better and we're closer to the end of this. What do you hope we all realize about the power of live music and even live performance when we all do return to life, both from a performer perspective and the audience? Well, it's just not to take it for granted. I mean, that was one of the first things I said in these concerts that I opened for Ruben. I said, welcome back to live music. And the audience just roared. You know, just the absence of live music was felt so strongly in that audience. Like, I can't tell you. I mean, you know, Joe and I and James just kind of sat there and we were like, wow, I guess that hit that hit a nerve or that hit a button yeah we can't take it for granted and you know you can zoom all you want and listen on your earphones but live is live there's nothing like it and it will never disappear and it will never go away i mean with with technology today and you know all kinds of streaming etc um that's that's happening and advancing there is still Nothing like live music and live theater as well, you know, to throw that in. The experience is so one-on-one. -on -one, it's so present. Um, it's so now, and there's nothing like it. You know, out of adversity, there's always levels of strength we attain, you know, like, like the greatest generation and, and all of those other monikers that we dub certain generations. And this is probably one of the toughest things that most people – I mean, I even know from my generation that we've ever experienced. So my question to you is this. As an artist, as we reemerge and, and get back to these things that we've been away from for so long, how do you view artists being stronger in light of what we've all gone through? I think it also challenges performers um, and musicians and singers that when they do perform live, as well, not take it, take advantage of it. But I think in, the, in our creativity to continue to develop material, music, situations, performances that will keep audiences coming back for more. And it's a real challenge, I think, for, for performers today. So everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans. Ultimately, you live your life. You have a perception of who you are. Who do you think you are? 
Who am I? I don't know. Isn't that everybody's question for themselves? Uh, I'm still a kid at heart. I still, there's so much more to learn. Um, I'm, I'm a student. I continue to be a student, you know, even, even though I have a lot on my resume in different areas of my life, I'm still a student. I don't want to stop, and I hope I never do. That's a wonderful answer. I will never forget when I was in my 20s in college, I was in a poetry class, and there was a woman in there, and I think she had to be in her 70s. And she just looked at all of us and said, I just want you all to remember one thing as you live your lives. Don't ever grow up. And just Absolutely. a twinkle in her eye. You know, I mean, it was it was one of the most profound things. And she embodied that idea, you know, keep learning, stay young, and just go for it, you know, and that's beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. I think once you stop learning, you just, you just die. Yeah. You just die, you know, and that's not why, why even continue living, you know, um, I, I, I never, and I never understand what retirement means, you know, unless yeah. you have a plan, unless you have a plan to do something else or do something interesting or new in your life, you know, I mean, retiring just sitting around on a couch i don't know watching tv i don't you know i, I don't get it i don't either I, um I, yeah. I don't and i tell people i said i want to die like on stage performing you know right. i don't ever ever want to stop that's a great memory you've got yeah yeah for sure hey this has been wonderful luma thank you happy holidays i really appreciate your time again my pleasure thank you so much joe thanks for listening and tuning in to another neon jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and singers in la new york kansas city and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz and thanks to luba for her time music and stories if you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.